the day transpires to be the start of something incredible. It's now late November and we've seen more whale blows 40 kilometres offshore. At first, there appear to be just two humpbacks. But then, more and more animals arrive. It must be timed to coincide with the seasonal peak in scrap numbers. It seems we've come across a North Atlantic oasis of life. The humpbacks now appear to be competing with one another for the fish as they lunge aggressively out of the water. This is just unbelievable, here in Ireland, in the winter time. And then, as unexpectedly as they arrived, the whales dive, and it's the very last we see of them. These encounters have allowed us to record and identify four individual humpbacks by photographing the underside of their tails. Comparing these with the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group catalogue, we are able to confirm that these were some of the same individual whales we'd seen feeding at the Blasket Islands this summer, and would normally have gone to Ireland's south coast to feed in early winter. But for the first time ever, None did. And so, my excitement is tinged with concern. Have these whales come up north because the food supply isn't available on the south coast this year? We know conservationists have been saying for 10 years there's too much fishing of sprat going off on the south, on the south coast of Ireland. There's no total allowable catch, so fishermen can catch as much as they possibly want. Here's a very key species that converts plankton, because they feed on plankton, into food that they're fed on by bigger fish and by whales. So while it's on the face of it quite a positive development, it may not be all entirely so. You know, there's still so little we know about these animals. But overall, I, you would have to say it's an incredibly positive sense to see all of these animals here. Humpback whales, minke whales, bluefin tuna feeding off the west coast of Ireland. It's just incredible to see. What a year it's been. Hi everyone, I am Finn van der Aar and welcome to the Oceans of Learning webinar. I am so excited to have you guys all here. Um, that was just some absolutely amazing footage there from Ken O'Sullivan's Deep Atlantic and just a wonderful taste of what we have to come in the next hour. We are kicking off this four week uh, Marine Institute campaign celebrating our seas and raising awareness around the just plethora of amazing offshore resources that Ireland has. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about our podcast as well later. Um, just a little on what is coming up in the next hour. We have a climate panel with uh, Mar Mary Donnelly, Chair of the Climate Change Advisory Council. We have Professor Andy Wheeler, Chair of Geology and a Marine Geologist from UCC in Cork. We have Glenn Nolan of the Marine Institute. I'll be chatting to Roberta O'Brien, uh, the first female Naval Commander, and we will be chatting to Louise Alcock as well, Professor of Zoology from NUI Galway, my beloved alma mater 
in just a few minutes. But first off, we have Ken O'Sullivan, the filmmaker of the clip that you just saw, uh, whose amazing doc on Irish waters just really opened up this whole new world, I think, to Irish audiences. So, um, Ken, I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Yeah, no, and that was, I mean, such a wonderful way to kind of kick us off there, um, getting to see a little bit of your footage. Um, you're also, I believe, making a new series as well for RTE? We are we're making another um, Atlantic series currently, so we're about a year into production. And um, uh, yeah, so hopefully 2022, COVID allowing, so certainly not easy at the moment. But yeah, yeah. we've made, this, this will be our fifth, uh, I think, um, marine natural history series in Irish waters. So, yeah. Amazing. And um, I guess, uh, obviously, people have seen a clip there, but maybe I'll take it back a little bit for them, um, first of all. So where did your interest in the ocean, your love of the ocean, kind of come from? Um, my father came from uh, Phoenix Island, County Kerry, which is a small, tiny island on the north side of Trilly Bay. And my family had lived there since about 1750 as uh, small fishermen and, and small farmers. And uh, I would have spent my summers there with my father fishing and with uh, very old methods, trammel nets and haul nets and spiller lines and dick and periwinkles and cardine and uh, just, you know, beautiful. The old people had a very lyrical connection with the, the natural world and particularly with the coast. Um, you know, they described it very beautifully and, and, and they revered it greatly. And, um, you know, it's, it's very, I suppose, profound for us because my father would have told me that, you know, it was the sea that helped our family to survive the famine. And at the okay. high point of the famine, I can remember my father showed me this huge metal pot and he said that his grandmother was uh, cooking once or twice a week at the height of the famine to feed people from the mainland who would come out because okay. the island the people resources that were, were very there. resourceful and able to fish. So couldn't have been more profound. Um, and I suppose that the, 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 the ultra profound moment for me was when I, I, I was the first of a very long line of, of people to cross that membrane, if you like, from, from the air into the underwater world and um, to observe and to see what had sustained my family you know, for generations and to see the, the vibrant beauty uh, and, and, and richness of the ecosystems and the creatures. And, you know, I kind of unconsciously said the first time I dived and dropped down, it's just in my head, I thought, oh my God, my father would have, would have loved this. And, um, but the difference in, you know, seeing, for example, you know, dogfish and, and beautiful creatures that, you know, that I, I only ever saw dead and dying in fishing nets, that to see them in their natural habitat for the first time, and beautiful they are, and how they swim around in the abundance of air. And uh, anyway, and, and sadly then the beauty, as the more that you see, the more you start to realize the issues and every dive I come back from, I have stuff for 20 years, three years diving, I'm still talking to scientists, so I was looking up stuff, and sadly the problems mount and mount and mount. <laughs> I want to depress everybody. No, that's okay. And in fairness, just a, a very happy thought. But your your visuals in the Deep Atlantic were absolutely amazing, and the reaction Thank to that film much. has kind of been phenomenal. Like even as a marine biologist, I'm still watching it with friends, going, "Wow! Oh my God! Oh, it's like you know, just physically reacting out loud because it was impossible not to. What what we were looking at was was amazing. Can you tell us a little bit about the reaction? Um, the reaction to it. Ah, sure, look, it was unreal, you know, I mean, in the first case, I, I'm a cameraman and a filmmaker, I certainly didn't want to be a presenter, but I was kind of less with no choice, and um, uh, that's the format that works for broadcasters, so I was the only person that could do it, because no one else is going to come and sit in the hinge for two or three years and wait for weather conditions. So, uh, or, go, look, or go to an offshore um, shelf in a dinghy. Well, <laughs> a rib. <laughs> anyway, a bit of lunacy alcohol. Anyway, look, we're, we're very safe and we're very considered in our approach to safety. And uh, oh, But look, the reaction was fantastic. In particular, I suppose social media in some ways makes the world very democratic because in the past we would have depended on, on media critical reviews in the newspapers, whereas the Twitter response on the night the first episode went out was just overwhelming. I mean, there were literally thousands of responses and, and you know, we, we had the tarnish to Simon Coveney tweeting every Amazing. school to, kid in Ireland should see this, which I was absolutely lovely because we donated the series to the Department of Education and I was able to reply, well, your dream's going to come true. So uh, we gave it for free and there's now 18 sections on the junior cycle curriculum. And, I think that's um, absolutely brilliant. And actually, maybe will we show, um, will we show everyone um, a little clip, another little clip, actually. What was the next one that we had lined up? If you're asking me, I'd say yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, here we go. 
west of the Blasket Islands, I encounter the most amazing feeding activity. This time, it's enormous shoals of sprat and sand eels that have gathered to feed on the rich plankton, thriving on the nutrients from the deep. And again, common dolphins buzz around trying to herd the fish. But the bait balls are really dynamic, like whirlwinds, always on the move. And they quickly sweep past me, diving down to the depths. I seem to be alone. But something is happening in the deep. A minky whale, sleek and incredibly adapted to glide through the ocean. Holding my breath, I follow them to the depths. The minky lunges at Sprat, while common dolphins pick up some of the stunned fish. This feels like another world. Only the need to breathe takes me momentarily away from it. Minkies, like humpbacks and blue whales, have evolved pleated throats that can balloon open to almost half their body size to capture fish. Their power and grace is breathtaking. I never knew minkies fed like this, but it turns out neither did anyone else as it becomes the first time this behavior has ever been filmed. Ken, that was absolutely amazing. Really, really beautiful footage. Um, I guess a, a great question is you you looked at a few species that have really not been seen at all and especially maybe not been filmed in Irish waters. Is there any species you are still to see? Or, oh, I don't want to say catch because it sounds wrong. Oh God, there are dozens, I mean, hundreds. Um, I mean, we've got, about, we've got about, well, it's different. I mean, I love sharks. and uh, But, you know, in terms of whales and dolphins, there's about a third of all the species that are in the world have been seen in Irish waters. And um, in terms of sharks, I mean, we have 30 or 40 species of sharks and 30 or 40, 40 species of other level banks, scapes and rays, and uh, probably sharks in particular. Um, they're That's absolutely cool. beautiful sharks, quite similar to great whites, about two and a half meters. And they were once abundant in our waters, but sadly not anymore due to overfishing and, and decimation of their prey species. So, yeah, look, it could have been three lifetimes. And, uh, Completely. <laughs> well, and I guess with that kind of in mind as well, obviously you kind of mentioned that um, when you were going on your dives, you're seeing these beautiful creatures, but then you're also seeing a little bit of, or a lot of um, the negative effects of humankind on the water. So as maybe like a final question, just to take away for our viewers and anyone watching this afterwards, um, maybe something that you think they can do um, to help protect our oceans. Uh, look, everybody can do something. I mean, climate change is probably the, the single biggest threat. 
Um, as a, a guy said to me once, you know, a very senior civil servant, he said, my 16 year old daughter asked me if I could drive her into the climate change protest. And I asked her, could she cycle? <laughs> <laughs> we can all That's do something. Uh, overfishing is the greatest threat to the oceans. Well, along with climate change, we, we talk about ocean acidification, ocean, uh, noise pollution in the ocean, but overfishing, and we're not immune to it in Ireland. It doesn't mean we have to stop fishing. It means we've got to stop fishing certain species. We've got to fish differently. Yeah, and, okay. uh, you know, what people can do about that, I don't know. We've probably all seen the recent Netflix documentary, but try to, if you do buy fish from a sustainable source and... Uh, I definitely say people, people chat to the fishmonger. Yeah, they're just quickly, there, there's something going through the doll at the moment. Uh, Wicklow TD is, is, is proposing, putting, proposing legislation to protect basking sharks, you know. Write to your local TD, ask them, you know, can they do something about that? Or, you know, drop a line to your supermarket. I shop here every week. Please, could you use less single-use plastic? Um, you know, how many people would need to do that before supermarket chains would take note? You know, a thousand people yeah no know. definitely no because even you yeah. see the difference with their bins ken thank you so much for joining us and for anyone who would like to see more of the wonderful footage that he just showed it is available on rte player two parts and it is absolutely amazing we we'll completely recommend and more on ken's website as well thank you so much ken for joining us thank you um, so next, guys, we have Louise Alcock. She is from my alma mater in NUI Galway, so I'm very excited to talk to her. She is an expert in all things uh, octopus, but as well as that, in recent years, she's become uh, more interested in deep sea corals and sponges as well. So two things I'm just very excited to talk about. We also have some wonderful um, footage from her research as well. So Louise, I'm very excited to have you with us. Thank you very much. I love your background. Um, Louise, so... You have done so much kind of different interesting areas of research, but um, obviously looked at octopuses in particular. Can you tell me just a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so oct octopuses were my first love when I, when I went through college, uh, as you yourself did, like you found that loads of your peer group, they want to work on whales and dolphins. That's the first thing people see uh, uh, about the ocean. But I had this obsession with octopuses and I didn't let it go. And, and, and I expressed this to my lecturers and I managed to get a PhD actually working on Antarctic octopuses. So I had this like fantastic PhD where I got to the Southern Ocean lots of times. Um, and, and, and that just spiraled from there. I, I, I carried on working from octopuses, but I got really fascinated by deep sea octopuses. And so I was doing more and more deep sea work. And so then I got fascinated by other things in the deep sea because the deep sea is also a truly amazing place. Um, so, so now I have kind of two strands of research. One is still octopuses and squids and, and the other is, is more, more general um, deep sea work. So, so I work in the North Atlantic, that's what's in my background here. And um, I take the deep water ROV Holland One down to the depths to, to 1,000, 2,000, even 3,000 meters deep and look at the seafloor down there. That's amazing. And I feel like as well, um, like obviously if you work in marine science, maybe you're used to octopuses or, or know a little bit about them, but um, it feels like, uh, you know, the film My Octopus Teacher has kind of brought them into the forefront and uh, obviously a really, really popular Netflix documentary. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the species? I think it was kind of a shock for people to realize that they were so intelligent. Maybe it was not so known before. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful documentary because it's not it's not a natural history film. Obviously, it wouldn't be winning an Oscar if it were. It's about one man's <laughs> personal journey and his connection to an octopus. But he's a filmmaker, an underwater filmmaker. And so the cinematography is just gorgeous. And the shots of octopuses are fantastic. And of course, octopuses um, are amazing animals. I mean, they do all this amazing color change. Um, so they're very spectacular. And of course, they their body is just so completely different from ours that they're, they're sort of um, you know, articulated arms that can just move in any shape. And, and I mean, their brain and everything is completely different from us because they're, of course, they're a mollusk. They're not that far removed from the snails in our garden. So their internal makeup is completely different. So the way they're intelligent is completely different from ours. It's uh, from us. It's not like a dog where we know their brain is quite similar to us and we can yeah. think about it. So they're motivated. Just just completely different and yet intelligent and curious and movable they can squeeze through tiny holes because they haven't got any bones so it's so i mean i've just been fascinated my whole life by them and and that's not changed as you can see no totally and actually we have some of your videos as well so we might queue one of those up and we'll just kind of chat while it's going um because i think kind of what even what you touched on there of um when these videos are two even three thousand meters down i think 
people nearly imagine it's just a vast empty abyssal plain and sometimes sometimes it is sometimes the video footage can uh, just be sand but obviously there's something amazing here could you tell us a bit about it yeah so this is a deep water octopus called granulenni varicosa and in fact you don't normally see it on soft sediment like this you normally see it within deep water coral and uh, and here's a different species this is a muse octopus species and this is hanging out on a vertical wall and again this is really deep i mean it's well lit because we've got the rov lights on but um this is this is probably 1800 meters 2000 meters deep and you can see the coral above it there and the octopus is probably just blinded by our lights and, and like completely confused by what's going on now. But you can see the classic octopus body. Um, it's not coloured the way the shallow water ones are. I'll get back to that in a minute because this is a pelagic octopus. These are really cool. So it's ballooned its web up and it's floating just um, above the seafloor. And this particular species of octopus is amazing because if we could see inside that web, it's actually got luminescent suckers. It produces light in its suckers to attract food. And then this is a bit of footage from um, the American uh, cruise, actually, Okeanos, the explorer. The rest of the footage is all mine. But this is a serrate, a Dumbo octopus um, on, on the seafloor. And they swim just above the seafloor. And we have these same species in, in our waters. So, so I didn't have footage of this, but we see these creatures. So these are all through Irish waters, these amazing octopuses. And you, um, you mentioned there that the, one of the first ones we were looking at was a pelagic octopus. So I know myself from uh, diving and uh, kind of a while ago diving in Greece, I was used to looking at the dens and um, I kind of hadn't realized. It. So are there ones that also don't just live on the seafloor? Do they also live in the water column? Yeah, so most octopuses live on the seafloor, especially in shallow water, but there's a few strange groups that don't. There's there's the argonauts that float on the surface. People may have seen Great blanket name. octopuses, certainly on videos on YouTube, which are a pelagic species that, that um, really have these, they have a fantastic web which they can um, unfurl and look spectacular as, as a response to, to any kind of threat. And we also have some small ones, um, some other bioluminescent ones actually that are in our midwater, say, 500 to 800 meters depth. Oh. So we actually have a really um, diverse range of different species and, and they, they, some of them are really wild looking. We have Vampyrotuthis um, infernalis as well, the vampire squid really? in Irish waters. But of course they're at depths that, that you yeah. wouldn't see them unless you take an ROV down and hang it in those midwater depths. With a load of bright lights. <laughs> um, yeah, no, completely. And, and this is a bit of a random one, but I, I read a, a scientific American article a good few years ago, maybe 2016, and it was talking about um, the kind of explosion of octopus and squid populations. I think they were more talking about the Pacific just to do with kind of the lack of predation and stuff. Are we seeing anything like that in Irish waters? What's the population like or healthy, increasing, declining? It's difficult to say exactly because octopuses have this very flexible lifestyle. So if an octopus is born late in this or, or, or a squid is born late in the season and it doesn't because they, they, they live for about a year on average. And they spawn at the end of that year, that, so they lay eggs and then they die. But if they don't reach sufficient maturity by that spawning season, actually what they do is they live till the next year and then they spawn and they die. Does that so mean they, they get a lot bigger? Or if they have a little bit bigger, growth? yes. Okay. Yeah. But, but so they've got this huge flexible um, lifestyle that they can change in response. And this makes them very responsive to things like climate change. If there's an opportunity, their populations can explode. Um, yeah, I, but, but we don't, because they change year on year as well, you actually need like 20 years of data to say, is there a big change going on? Yeah. And actually there's, a, there's a, um, a working group, an EU working group that's actually looking at this at the moment that gives fisheries advice and, and they're, they're working on this. And there are some changes. We've got um, a squid species called Ilex, which is really a population that's breeding in the North Sea, which, which never used to happen as far as we know. So there are some changes happening, but you need to look at that full time scale okay. to really yeah. figure out, are they exploding? And that's going and on at the moment. You actually mentioned um, when we were looking at the other video just a little bit about octopus living in coral and getting into kind of some deep sea coral research. We have some footage of that as well. I think that we can have a look at now. Um, and so again, I'm very excited about this because um, Lophelia pertusa and kind of the associated biodiversity was was my my area back in the day. But, yeah. um, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, about what you've been studying here? Yeah, so so this is this is black coral on the sea floor actually, um, and these are these are supposed to be really rare but Irish waters are fantastically rich in them in certain places 
Um, and now what you can see that the small gray bits of coral on the bottom are, are, are clumps of, of framework building coral like Lophelia and, and its deeper water species, Selena similia. And then you can see bamboo corals, which are octocorals growing out of this. And again, we're looking at a guess, this is about 15 to 1800 meters depth. Yeah. And um, maybe just for, for people watching as well, they're, they're probably more used to seeing corals in the kind of tropical sunny. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the ones in the deep sea maybe actually live? Or how they yeah. Live? Yeah, so of course in the in the tropics they've got these symbiotic algae with them, which are which are the, the powerhouses and producing the energy they're photosynthesizing. But down here without our ROV lights, it's pitch black. But what they're living on is what we call marine snow. And this is sort of the flocculated particles that have come from the plankton bloom right in the surface waters and, and, and settled down. And you, we get a lot of filter feeders here, particularly in the submarine canyons, because the shape of the canyons channels that food towards the coral. So we, it's very, very rich. I mean, you can see on this wall here, again, this is this is getting close to 2000 meters depth. And you can see how rich the corals are. That bright pink one is, its common name is bubblegum coral. You can see why. <laughs> Great name. Closely, you can see these, the polyps on it. These would also be nursery grounds as well, wouldn't they? I think people might like to know a little bit about. Yes, that's right. You you get fish laying eggs on, on, on corals. And so they're very important habitats. They're very food rich. I mean, here, I mean, you can see a fish in this area. Um, this is Lophelia. This is the Lophelia reefs at about 900 meters. And you can see the two color morphs, the white and the orange. And this whole mound is full, full of, of coral. Um, and I mean, there's, there's just so much other diversity. And you can think about the hiding places there for little animals to live when they're small and vulnerable to predation. So they're really, really important in increasing bio, biodiversity and providing protection for, for hatchlings and juvenile fish. Completely. And I, and I even know as well from my own studies, I remember it, it wasn't even just the, the macrofauna that were associated. We were looking at all the microfauna that were kind of living in the structures. And we'll actually be chatting to Andy Wheeler as well later, who's kind of looking at those reefs from a geological perspective. So it's a, a good kind of a mix. Um, what I was going to ask you as well, um, I think for our um, viewers as well, just um, you, you talked a little bit about sponges. I, I feel like maybe people don't actually know that much about sponges, even deep sea sponges, or even what they are. We're thinking of like the thing you use in the shower as opposed to a living creature. Yeah, I mean, sponges, sponges are animals, they're filter feeders. Um, and and the, the, the two dominant groups really in the deep sea are, are corals and sponges. Some places you get a mix of both, some places you get um, coral reefs, some places you get sponge reefs. But spongy, the sponges, again, really produce habitat they drop spicules and that spicule mat makes a, um, a, a substrate for other organisms. And the, the biodiversity around places where the, where the sponge reefs is, is hugely um, increased compared to, to the sort of muddy uh, areas beyond okay. that. So, so yeah. they're also really, really important. Habitat the, builders. Some of the little barrel sponges, I've seen like um, cephalopod eggs laid in them, things like that. So again, they're providing nursery habitat for other species. And I think actually just talking of nurseries there, we have one other little clip as well of a shark nursery video. So hopefully that will pop oh, up. Yes. So this was a real find. This wasn't on one of my expeditions. This was on the Sea Rover expedition, but I was on board. I was in bed when we found this uh, and I got up to it the next morning. And I'm in shrieks of excitement. Uh, very little that is known about shark nurseries generally. We know they lay their eggs somewhere, but where is always the question. And um, what, you, what you'll be able to see in this clip is so many shark eggs. I mean, I think lots of people watching will know just what a shark egg looks like. They're called mermaid purses and you see them washed up on the shore and they're like, like little leathery packets um, with little tendrils coming off them that, and the tendrils can uh, attach to things to keep themselves in place. And here you can see the sharks. So these are all black mouth cat sharks. And I mean, just look at how many there are. There are oodles Amazing. of them. But all the little black things that you can see on the floor, and you'll see it in, in better detail in a minute. So all those little black things, they're all mermaids' purses. So that sea floor is covered in shark eggs. And this is quite near the Lophelia reefs, or it's between Lophelia reefs. And there's a lot of coral rubble on the floor here. And I mean, maybe this just provides perfect habitat with just, you know, maybe it just lifts the, the um, you can see the coral rubble there. Perhaps it just lifts the shark eggs. All those brown things are shark eggs. Perhaps it just lifts them up enough to, to keep them well aerated. And, and I guess, Louise, while we're kind of looking at habitats, it's, it's a lovely chance to see them. Um, as a, maybe a last question, just a little takeaway for our viewers. What is one thing you think uh, everyone can do to help to protect our oceans? 
Uh, I, I'm with I'm with Ken actually completely that that climate change. So so stop burning fossil fuels. Anything you can do to cycle, walk, or make any changes to your house are really important. Um, other threats are pollution. So so making making sure that that we we don't pollute. Writing to your TD, um, pressing for good farming practices because a lot of the pollution in, in nitrogen runoff comes from farms. So we can all do something. Absolutely. Louise, thank you so much for joining me. It was great to chat to you and to see a little bit of your videos as well and learn a little bit more about your research and looking forward to keeping up with it now afterwards. Thanks, Thanks again so much for having me, Finn. No worries. So guys, before we get into the next uh, little bit that we pre-recorded earlier with Roberta, I want you to get out your phones. As I mentioned a little bit at the start, our podcast went live today. So the first episode is with Dr. Eski Britton. We're talking all about the how your health and well-being is connected to the ocean. We had a great panel chat um, on biodiversity as well. You can find it uh, pretty much anywhere you find your podcast, whether that's Apple Podcasts. We actually uh, launched in the charts this week, which was really, really exciting um, before we even had the episode out. And you can get it on Spotify, anywhere else. Give it a listen, rate, review, subscribe. We'd be delighted to have any chats with you about it. You can always send me messages after you've um, had a listen on Instagram, any questions at all that you have. So get your phones, subscribe now. Um, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, you're going to get lots, lots more of that on the podcast. Um, so next up earlier, I caught up with Commander Roberta O'Brien. She was the first female commander in the Irish Navy. It was an absolutely fascinating chat. I could have kept her on for hours, but um Really hope you guys enjoy it. She talks a little bit about um, kind of her training, how she got into the Navy, the kind of role of the Navy in Ireland and um, her role as a commander. So guys, just before we do that, it's the Oceans of Learning podcast with the Marine Institute. Check that out. And now we're going to have a look at our chat with Roberta. When I was growing up, I was big into the outdoor pursuits, a lot of sports, hurling and Gaelic football. Um, and um, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do when I left school, but I was also interested in the academic side of things. I, I actually love maths um, when I was in school. And when we went on a day trip to Warford Port and um, for our geography, the economic uh, component of it, we got a tour around Warford Harbour. And I was really interested um, in the role of what a captain of a merchant vessel even did. And, I started asking uh, the tour guide questions and I said, what do you, have to, you know, what helps to be good? And he said, well, if you're good at maths and um, that does help with the navigation element of it and you're out and you're bringing cargo from X um, place to, to Z. And then I went home and I was talking to another area and um, is that my mother grew up on the island of Paul Bolan, where the naval base is situated. So when I kind of said, oh, I'd be interested in that, she, her ears pricked and she was thrilled because um, her dad, my grandfather, was in the Irish Navy up until uh, his retirement, uh, God rest him, and he made the rank of the most senior um, non-commissioned officer, warrant officer, seaman. So she, she told me about what the Navy did. And she said, uh, I think they're taking women because, strangely enough, when I was growing up, um, and it's hard to believe that uh, they didn't take women prior to 1995, uh, but the more I got in, uh, found out about it, uh, my uncle, uh, we do have a strong connection in the military. My uncle was serving in the Navy at the time as an engine room artist, and he told me more about it, the patrols. And my uncle was working in the printing press, so he was able to give me uh, the application forms and whatnot. So the more I found out about it, I said, yeah, that's for me, the outdoor life, even though I hadn't been on... A, a yacht or on ships. The most I had been is in the ferry over to, to Wales. Um, I knew I liked it. I loved the sea anytime I had gone down to Cork to visit my, my cousins. Um, and uh, it really appealed to the dual side of it, outdoor life, but yet a bit of academic and leadership. And, and also an added bonus is that when I was taken in is that there was um, a promise of being sent to NUI Galway to get a science degree. Ah, uh, yeah, of so, course. And so would you have joined then kind of straight out of secondary school and gone into yeah. that college program? Yes, my parents signed me away. Ironically, I was uh, what was considered the, the child soldier. Um, you now have to be 18 when you join. But um, yeah, I was 17 for a few months. So I, uh, the, the big joke amongst our class was that, um, yeah, the minister is, is responsible for you until you turn 18. 
Um, so yeah, I was part of that intake that went to NUI Gaul. Like we, I went straight from school. I uh, was lucky as successful for the, the two year cadetship and on completion, I went to NUI Galway and did a Bachelor of Science um, degree. And that was an area that I was interested in because when I applied for the Navy, I also applied for uh, PE teaching and I w with the hope of bringing science uh, with, so for me, the Navy was ticking all the boxes of what I um, was hoping to, to study when I got, when I left school. That's very cool that you said. I didn't even realize that the that Ireland wasn't taking women till did you say uh, 1995? 1995. Yeah. That's well, bad. we myself and uh, Lieutenant Commander Orla Gallagher, we were the first women to be taken into the the Irish Navy. Uh, the story goes that the competition was opened in ninety four, but they didn't find anyone suitable. Strangely oh, enough, I don't know about um, that. Yeah. So um, we were the, the the first to join. So you can imagine that that was. Um, that's very cool novelty. yeah no completely because i remember even stories from my mom telling us about um when they would do different exercises and stuff in the summer say with other navies and as well uh the women weren't allowed to sleep on the ships so they actually had to row ashore and camp so i'd well I'm glad, believe you know I'm glad yeah it's changed i'm glad when, I, changed. when I came into and i you'd see the documentation on the study that was done uh, a female officer uh god rest her soul um Mary Jo Sullivan went was sent out onto one of the ships to ascertain was it a suitable environment for women and thankfully she was very positive about our capabilities yeah yeah definitely oh uh, yeah it's literally ship shape um but that's very cool and so obviously the, the process is a little different now if someone is joining now would they be heading to the NMCI if they're going to be commissioned? that is correct um they go to the National Maritime College of Ireland which uh when I was I trained a cadet class subsequently in 2004 and we were the, the they were the first class to kind of uh, sorry the second class to actually uh, get trained there so it's a mix of uh, the a military uh, cadetship and then linking up with your nautical science background and they're they're of they even get a better qualification in terms of they get the merchant sea time so they get exposure to life out on a merchant ship and in a on a naval warship so and it's accredited as well yeah no it's a great mix I've, I've actually worked at sea before with um i can't remember her name now but um someone who was did both merchant navy and irish navy as well so yeah it's, it's great to have the mix um, yeah. Fantastic centre down there as well. Um, the the marine biology course in UCC, we do our uh, sea survival and our navigate our radio license in the, the Navy the base. The BHF, yeah. the GMDSS yeah. program. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's We're an amazing uh, setup, and even the simulators, and yeah, the sea survival. When we did it way back when I was a cadet, uh, they threw the, the the life raft off the side of the ship down in the basin. But it's now it's it's fantastic as you've done it like you know yeah, the simulation of the waves yeah. and the the darkness the thunder and lightning and I did the course with my crew when I took over command at the time and it really does gel and bond the crew together and even how you work together and getting into that life raft if you recall how difficult yeah. it can be. Oh, completely. I think we we were quite unlucky as well. We did in a in a. January when it seemed like half the class had the uh, winter vomiting bug so it was entertaining shall we say um but actually and just you kind of touched on it there um when you obviously became the first female uh commander in the Irish Navy which is pretty amazing um what was that uh, process like so was that to captain a ship then or how did it work what was your the way it job? works uh no to captain a ship you make the rank of lieutenant commander Lieutenant Commander had always been on my side, and then I didn't know whether I was going to stay or what. And um, as I was um, looking around at different options, I got more interested and I said, you know what, I do want to make uh, the rank of commander. Um, so I said, um, spoke to uh, my husband, as I said, is a military officer also. And uh, the way he said it, why not? Like, you know what I mean? What is stopping me? And there's a nine month course in uh, the Curra that you're away from Monday to Friday. And I had, uh, we have three beautiful children we're blessed with. So you're trying to balance that and every uh, parents know trying to get that work-life balance is, is uh, challenging at the best of times. And unfortunately, even with the pandemic, uh, it's, it's even that more challenging. Uh, but he said, look, just go for it. Like, you know, if you want, and you spoke about uh, Canadian people. We were very, very lucky that uh, we got a fantastic au pair for that year. Um, Ali Cop, uh, she's a very good friend now, um, was amazing helping looking after uh, the, the kids. 
uh, be, while I was on that course, which made uh, getting uh, the course completely possible. Uh, it didn't happen overnight, uh, getting to the rank of commander. Um, I think you were asking me earlier, um, like that. Uh, I think this was the fifth time that I had gone uh, for promotion for interview. So, as people will be very much aware, like each time you're that that you're not successful, you have to brush yourself off and reflect and see how you can improve and enhance. Um, so I took the opportunity then. I had never had uh, an opportunity to serve overseas. And uh, I went, um, you're probably aware that uh, the Naval Service had sent ships down to off Pontus, which became uh, off Sophia and now is Operation Irini, which is the EU's response to the migrant crisis. So I volunteered to go over um, as part of the force headquarters staff so I served on board uh, Italian ship and my role actually wasn't, uh, it, was, it was different. It was, uh, I wasn't driving the ship myself or taking command of it. I was responsible for the human resource management of the force headquarters staff. So it was really interesting time. Um, so I think all those kind of components helped me get to the rank of commander eventually. No, amazing. And also a good example of, of perseverance. You know, I think it's nice that idea of, yeah, you can just dust yourself off and, you know, you'll get there. Um, and you kind of touched on a little bit there. I think um, uh, maybe obviously for myself working in, in the marine sector, I know a little bit about what the Irish Navy does, but but maybe for some of the um, viewers on the webinar, could you tell them a little bit more about the role of the Irish Navy? Well, the Naval Service uh, comes under the umbrella of the Defence Forces, which we have the Army, the Air Corps and the Navy. And uh, the Navy are the principal seagoing agency of the state. Um, and our main uh, role is um, maritime defence security operations. What does that mean to the people listening in? It means surveillance out at sea, maritime interdiction operations. What does that mean? Is that we're keeping an eye on uh, all the vessels coming into our area of operation um, in terms of it could be smuggling, people uh, looking for um, gold bullions on the bottom of the seabed, check out wreckages. Treasure hunters. Um, uh, keeping an eye on our fiber optic cables um, to ensuring that our marine life, the coral uh, that has been found over 300 miles west of Galway, that that is protected, um, that um, we are there for search and rescue. We provide support, as I touched on it, uh, in terms of peace support operations for um, EU now for Med, which was Operation Sophia now off uh, Irini. Uh, providing support during this pandemic to the HSE in terms of setting up testing and tracing uh, centres around and supporting that's very our interesting. Area. I'd say a lot of people don't know that actually, so that's very cool. And it's an interesting one as well, what you mentioned about the corals, because um, obviously after Sea Spiracy came out, one of the questions I was getting a lot was, um, could you tell us if the SACs in Ireland are protected? So it's nice to be able to say, now I can definitively they say are, yes, they are. And yeah. they, we actually, in our fishery monitoring centre, there is an alarm that goes off if trawlers go in, trawling around those areas. Oh, really? And obviously kind of looking at the, the fishery side of things as well, um, I feel like Irish fisheries are in the news a lot lately because we're looking at kind of the fallout from Brexit and what it's going to mean in terms of quotas and stuff. Will, will what you guys be doing in terms of fisheries, fisheries protection be changing at all in the coming years? Or? Oh, it's uh, increased tenfold. Again, I was on to my colleagues in the Fishery Monitoring Centre recently and like our staffing levels have had to increase because no longer is our neighbour a part of the EU. They're considered a third a third country de facto. So in terms of the paperwork for landing of from the basics of landing your fish, fish old uh, into the Ireland from the UK to Ireland and vice versa. It's increased by 85% the amount of paperwork that has to be done. And also in terms of uh, the staffing levels within the Fishing Monitoring Centre um, on the naval base, we'd increase from 12 to 42, uh, which was a major increase and get people to, to work in that area as yeah, well. Of this, this is, like from when I joined, we were 200 miles out to the EEZ and then we were one of the first countries to, to get access to our continental shelf per se. So that's now out to 350 nautical miles west of, of Galway, which includes the, the coral that we spoke about. And that's like to give people context, it's 10 times the landmass of Ireland now that we have to patrol with our nine ships. Um, so it's very important to have what we call your smart patrolling, that it isn't the ship's captain. I don't just decide, oh, where will I go today? Uh, that the, you're tasked from operation, Naval Operations Command 
on the different areas and they uh, liaise and picked up a lot with the fishery monitoring center so that and as i said we have the recognized maritime picture which gives us a live feed and they have that on the ships as well which is fantastic with how technology has advanced from when when back in my day when we started, dare I say it, um, I'm getting old, uh, is that uh, you were looking at history, historic pictures to, to uh, forecast where you were going to get that bunch of trawlers or the activity. So there's now, it's, it's a more live feed. Yeah, and Rita, thank you so much. I've just one last question. Um, and I guess just in the, in the kind of coming years, what are the priorities say for yourself as a commander? Priorities for myself as a commander is that I want to, to see the, the organization grow. At the moment, we're unfortunately contracting and it's a it's a growing space, the maritime, we're an island nation. Uh, it's a growing space in terms of how climate change, I believe you're going to be talking about that later, where our policies are there that our government want to have zero carbon emissions by uh, 2050. And one area where there is a huge potential, as we know, is our wind uh, energy provision um, as a renewable uh, resource. So it's vital that the Navy are there present to protect us, to provide your safe and secure environment, to provide expertise and knowledge. So I would see in that we continue to innovate and support other our government to implement their other policies in terms of climate change. As a woman, I want to see more diversity in the organization. Um, as yes, I am the first commander, but to quote um, Lady uh, Kamala Harris's mother, um, make sure that I'm not last. And I take that serious. Um, so I want to see it as an inclusive, as well as diversity, but an inclusive organization and not just in terms of uh, gender, but also racial and cultural and socioeconomic background. We need to move with the times, grow. Uh, and also then finally, I'd like to see that we have our multi-role vessel, not even one, maybe two, that again, it's not just seen as a Navy asset, um, but it's um, a space asset that we can provide human humanitarian assistance to people around the, the, the world, wherever it's required. Because I saw firsthand when I was in Ox Sophia um, that it was a real proud moment to see an Irish ship helping uh, people in massive distress. Um, and uh, providing some service and solace to these people. And that's what we do well as a nation, peace support operations, assisting um, in this EU mig migrant crisis or wherever the future crisis may lay. Well, Roberta, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us today. You're uh, welcome, Finn. Great, thank no you. problem. So guys, we have been under the water with Ken and Louise. We have sailed the seas with Roberta and um, even though she touched a little bit on, on climate change. So we are going to jump into our panel now and talk a little bit more about um, climate change, how it's affecting Ireland, Ireland's water. Uh, we have a fantastic panel of experts to chat to you today. We have Mary O'Donnell, um, Donnelly, sorry, Chair of the Climate Advisory Council. We have Professor Andy Wheeler, Marine Geologist and Chair of Geology and UCC. And we have Glenn Nolan, the Section Manager of the Oceanographic and Climate Services at the Marine Institute. Guys, you're all very welcome. Welcome. Um, Thank you very much. So I guess our first um, question, just maybe to give the viewers a little bit better idea of what you guys do. Um, Mary, could you tell me a little bit about your job uh, with the council? So uh, I, I've recently been appointed as chair of the Climate Change Advisory Council, and this is a, a council, an independent council set up by government uh, to advise on uh, how we progress in terms of fighting climate uh, and developing climate action. And we have an immediate task currently being debated in the in the Oireachtas, not yet finalised, but let us assume for the moment that it is adopted more or less as it stands. Um, one of, we, have, we have a number of tasks. The first one is to try and bring the 2050 net zero target more proximate to our daily lives, because 2050 is a long time away. Maybe not so long for you, Finn, but it's a very long way away from me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we wait until 2050, we can kind of say we can postpone things. So what we've been tasked to do is come out with a budget, a carbon budget. In other words, what's the maximum amount of emissions that Ireland can uh, have over the next five years? 
So okay. a budget for five years, the first half of this decade, another one for the second half and then into 2030. Okay. And that makes the target much more real, much more close to us uh, uh, in terms of what it is we need to do. And it really is designed to galvanize action as much Something as anything really else. Nice. Absolutely. And Glenn, um, obviously, work a little bit at Ocean Monitoring. I even know that you might be a surfer as well. Could you tell us a little bit more about your role in the Marine Institute? Sure, Finn. Yeah, good to be here. Um, so I'm an oceanographer at the Marine Institute, responsible for the Oceanographic and Climate Services Group. So that has a kind of a couple of different uh, strings to, to, to the bow, so to speak. The first is to advise the government uh, on the, the evidence it might need in terms of data collection for the key things that are happening in our oceans so that they can make good decisions around how the oceans are changing due to climate change. And the second part of the job is really more day-to-day -day stuff to support the governments and others in things like search and rescue and our general understanding of how the ocean works, the circulation patterns, the temperature and salinity patterns in the ocean, and to make sure that that data and that information is available to to people all around Ireland to help inform their interaction with the ocean. Okay, cool. And uh, I feel like I need to preface this with, um, Andy was actually my supervisor in college. So Andy, can you tell us a little bit about your work? And maybe I should also plug now that everyone should go and watch your TED talk. It's great. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm uh, delighted to, to be here. And um, I'm the professor of geology in University College Cork. So I, I kind of have two roles really. Obviously I'm an educator. Um, and I'm training the, the next generation of, of geologists and environmental scientists. Um, and I have a, a keen interest in the marine, so trying to fit marine components into the curriculum and make sure people are up to date, both in terms of their skills and their knowledge. Uh, but I'm also a researcher and a marine geologist. Uh, so Louise was showing all the wonderful animals. Uh, for some reason, somewhere along the way, I decided I was interested in the sediments, uh, which I'm still perplexed and why I'm fascinated by the sediments. But actually, it's not the sediments that interest me, it's what the sediments can tell us. Um, so I'm very interested in how sediments accumulate through time. If we study those sediments, we can use them to go back in time, if you like, and see how our oceans are changing. So we're aware that our oceans are very dynamic. Um, we know they can do some quite, quite surprising things if we go far enough back. So geology allows us then to see uh, where we've come from and perhaps as clues to where we're going to. So I'm very interested in deep marine environments. I've worked on cold water coral reefs, which are amazing archives as well as, as habitats. I'm very interested in the dynamics of our ocean. And Glenn's interested in monitoring them, which is, which is really important. Um, with some of the climate change um, uh, changes that, that we, that we um, recognize take tens of years um, to happen and hundreds of years. So going back a little bit further through cause, gives us a longer perspective and allows us to get a deeper and richer understanding of how oceans change beyond our, our, our own uh, short perspective. Yeah, completely. And, and I guess we're kind of the idea of extrapolating that forward. Um, Glenn, could you tell us a little bit? We're obviously looking at sea level, some fairly grim stuff, sea level rise, ocean acidification. Um, and just in terms of like how Ireland or the Marine Institute, how we're going to be managing things like that um, differently going forward. Well, I think that the key to understanding all of these things is to measure long term. So you probably know that governments typically think on quite short cycles. And uh, the challenge is always to convince, you know, successive funders and, and governments that uh, the climate game is, is a long game. You know, it's something you need to do in a sustained way over many, many years. You have to measure things like the, the sea level, as you mentioned, Finn. You have to measure the ocean temperatures, the heights of the waves and how they're changing over time, the changes in fish distributions. And uh, there is global efforts to explore what they call essential ocean variables. So uh, defining what are the most important things we need to measure in the ocean, because we can't measure everything all the time. So we have to measure a subset of all, of all the things that happen in the ocean. And, and to do that in a very systematic way with very good quality control, very good databasing, uh, and making sure as well that we don't just collect data, but we actually make the information available as evidence to policymakers, and we make it available to the general public in terms of outreach and uh, increasing their understanding of how the oceans are changing and what they might do to uh, to improve the situation or at least understand the situation. So, so really, long term monitoring is very important, and then uh, to look at things like climate projections over over 
decades and centuries as as Andy said that's that's very important he looks back over thousands of years we try to look forward a century or, or so to give policymakers a good idea of what might happen on a on a century time scale so that's they're, they're the two areas really observations and then uh, climate projections for the future under different greenhouse gas emission scenarios and Marie, actually, I, I heard a great podcast with you recently, and you, you talked about um, how we should be planning for a future climate now. So kind of looking at the work that, um, that Andy and Glenn are doing and, and kind of informing policy. Can you tell us about any maybe interesting policy changes and stuff that are going to be coming up in the next um, in the next while uh, with your work in the council? Well, w one of the things uh, that uh, I really do believe Ireland needs to be thinking about now and planning now is how we can sustainably use our natural resources. Uh, we have two very big natural resources. One is uh, our ocean, which, uh, as I was already said, is 10 times our landmass. But we also have the, you know, the best wind resource of any other country in Europe. Uh, and these two are really valuable resources for us and are key to our decarbonize effort, decarbonization effort in Ireland. And I would go further, it's, it, they can facilitate us to decarbonize the other sectors of you know, power, transport, buildings, and so on. But they also can be the source of new economies. You know, many years ago, somebody said somewhere, let's have a financial services center in Ireland. And I wouldn't say it was easy, but now we have a financial services center. Uh, I think the question that's on the table today is, are we going to have, you know, a zero carbon energy quarter along the West Coast in Ireland that can do lots of things? You know, it can produce, uh, you know, electrons for electricity. It can produce molecules for gas, hydrogen and others. So if that's the case, how can we plan that? How can we best roll that out? And how can we get the best value for that for Ireland Inc. and its population? Completely, and, it, and it's quite interesting. I work myself in Killy Bags, and I'm, I'm just starting to see the um, the kind of level of offshore wind infrastructure that's about to go out there. We're looking at all the turbines kind of broken up and, and ready to go out. Um, so I guess um, taking it back again, Andy, um, obviously you're kind of looking at past climates. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you see when you're doing, um, say, something like a core through a cold water coral uh, mound and kind of what you're learning from it? Yeah, sure. I mean, literally, as there is, as people know, when you dig down deeper, you're effectively going back in time. So we're looking at the, the, the properties of the sediment and the organisms. So we're looking at the, 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 the physical properties, the chemical properties, and also with, with fossils and microfossils, the biological properties. And we're trying to reconstruct, really, what happened in the past. Um, and we can sell certain things. I mean, ocean acidification is difficult. To find a proxy for, um, but we can look at you know amounts of carbonate and things like that, and um, we can certainly look at changes in ocean circulation and temperature. We have proxies for those. We can start to reconstruct things, but on a local scale with the cold water corals, we're very interested in looking at when the coral reefs change, and what was the environment when they changed. So when did the coral reefs stop? When did they start? What were the conditions? And when was that occurring? Was that occurring at times that are coincidental with climate shifts? So can we look at the vulnerabilities of certain habitats and try to work out what happens? And that gives us an idea then of the sensitivities in the models as we go forward. Um, so there's lots of different studies, but I actually would want to pick up on what Mary was saying about um, offshore wind, because that's very important. Um, and I've been working with some wind farm companies and looking at foundation design and where to site wind farms. And there really is a massive opportunity there um, for Definitely. offshore wind. And um, an opportunity with, with large turbines, significant distance from shore, where they're not causing massive visual uh, impacts to people. And even possibilities now with technology for floating wind, wind farms mm. as well. And this is really, really exciting. Um, it does offer op massive opportunities to decarbonize our energy system and economic and employment opportunities. But also what the, the industry is now looking at is not so much generating electricity, the possibility of using wind farms to generate um, hydrogen. Obviously, you can generate hydrogen from water, the ocean's okay. full of water. So we can get away from electric cars and difficulties that, that that has with batteries and supply of materials for batteries and start thinking ahead even further. 
to actually hydrogen vehicles. So, so there's really, really exciting technological solutions on our doorsteps that will actually make us um, help our economy and provide solutions for the planet. But it requires us and requires government to legislate responsibly. Someone put something in the chat about marine spatial planning. There are bills going through at the moment, but these have to all come together and we have to seize the opportunity to do things. Completely. A good time to live in a windy country. <laughs> Certainly. And, um, and kind of obviously, even just within this webinar itself and, and the podcast that we've been talking about before, um, we really are just seeing, especially with all the sea swimmers of COVID, um, this kind of interest in the marine. Glenn, could you talk to us a little bit about um, maybe something, what do you think of uh, introduction of marine science, climate science actually being something that's taught in schools? I think that's a great idea, Fian. I think um, you don't have to be in marine science very long to realize that the, the public's connection with, with the sea doesn't extend very far inland. And uh, I've had experience of going to schools and giving seminars. And usually if you're in a, a school in a coastal location, they kind of get the sea and they have their kayaks and they're, they're in the sea scouts and all these kinds of things. But when you, when you venture even 10 or 15 kilometers inland, it's all about farms and cows and a whole other, a whole other focus. And, and that to me tells us that we have a bit of a, an uphill battle and the earliest we can get it on the curriculum, I think that, that would be fantastic because uh, I think ki kids just they intuitively soak up a lot of this information. And if, if we can improve our, the way we communicate with, with, with kids in schools and uh, in, a, in a structured way, uh, then they become advocates for, for uh, preserving the ocean, for using the resources in the ocean in a sustainable way. And also things like being safe on the ocean is quite important because if, if you only have negative stories about people drowning and people going out in boats and never coming back, um, I think, you know, sea safety is actually an important part of the, the education around the sea as well, that it's a, it's a beautiful thing, but you have to respect it. And um, so you have to think about using it sustainably, but you also have to think about being safe around the sea. Um, but certainly the earlier you put it on the curriculum, the better it'll be. And then maybe into the into the secondary curriculum and then when you get to university level there's lots of very good teachers like Andy and really? other colleagues who, yeah. who can deliver the message um, but yeah the, the earlier we get into young people's heads the, the better about how, how valuable and wonderful the, the ocean is. Completely and I used to um, actually see it myself when I worked in the National Aquarium in Galway and you would see kids that maybe had no interaction with the ocean and then suddenly they're kind of like seeing a starfish for the first time, learning that you shouldn't touch it or pull it or do anything like that. And they've gone from it's this abstract thing to this thing that they want to protect. Um, so guys, um, just before we go, a question I kind of want to ask all of you, um, we've been asking all of our guests on the podcast is maybe one thing that our listeners, or in this case, our viewers today, um, can do for the ocean, something they can do now, something maybe they can implement in their life. Um, Marie, can we start with you? Well, I was going to make, make a comment that, in fact, I think what we can do for the ocean, in, in my understanding, because I'm not an expert in the area, is actually what we do on, on the land. And the thing on the land is, I would say, know our number. And what do I mean by that? We should know what energy we use. You can calculate it in kilowatts, and then you can translate it into emissions. And there are apps out there that can do this. Yeah. And I think if we all knew our number, at the start of the year and then said, okay, we're going to try and reduce it even by 5% over the year. I think it would make a very significant difference. Completely, if it's measurable, it can change. Um, Andy, same thing to yourself. There are, there are many challenges, but um, and I'd like to talk about persistent pollutions like, uh, like plastics, um, which, is a, which is a big issue. We know <coughs> they're, they're all over the oceans. Um, and a lot of them in the deep oceans are, are plastics from fishermen, it's not just us. Um, but it, it is a big problem. But I guess really, I, I think climate change is, is the big issue. Uh, we're a maritime ocean. Um, and what happens in our ocean affects our climate, but globally. So I mean, a, a big challenge for humanity and it's for the oceans and us is really reducing greenhouse gases. And to do that, if you look at your carbon budget, there's two big headline things. And I'm not going to be preaching here because I'm not necessarily doing it myself, but I should be. If you look at the two big headline carbon emissions, you can wind address a lot of things with your cars and all your rest of it. The two big headline emissions is planes, flying in planes. You know, that's you have massive carbon input there. We must reduce our planes. And, and the other thing then is ruminants, is cows and sheep 
in dairy products and meat. So unfortunately, we really want to make an impact. Unfortunately, we actually really do have to make an impact. It's veganism and it's airplane travel. And that's the big things. Uh, and we've got to do it. I'm sorry, we've got to do it. And that includes me. And, and then lastly, Glenn, just to yourself. And I think that, that you know, the ocean is a, it's a huge resource, but that, that's a double-edged sword sometimes because you also need to use the ocean in a, in a sustainable way. And I, I'd ask just any any individual, any citizen, um, you know, to just, you know, behave responsibly around the ocean to, uh, you know, not throw stuff over the side of a boat or off a pier when you're there. It might sound like small things, but they actually make a big difference because you can change the culture of them um, and people realize that there are opportunities in the ocean, but only if you treat it in a respectful way. And um, if you're exploiting oil and gas from the oceans that you you do it in, in as sustainable a way as, as possible. If you're developing a wind farm, same, same rules apply. You don't, because there are potential to pollute even from, from activities that are seen as green and climate friendly activities. So everything has to be done in a very responsible way. And that goes right down to the people who just go to the beach for, for a swim. You know, don't, don't throw your sandwich wrapper in, in, into, the, into the sea after you finish with it or, you know, basic things like that. So I think, I think you start from, from the basics and, and build from there. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much. Massive thank you for our panel. And uh, thanks to everybody watching for joining us today. Um, it's been absolutely amazing mix of speakers. If you want to hear more, we have lots planned. Uh, also, thanks to Dara Whelan, our fantastic producer who's been working tirelessly in the background to make this all go nice and seamlessly. Um, so just that last reminder for the podcast, it is out now. It's called Oceans of Learning. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any of those other places, um, give it a listen, rate, review, subscribe. We just found out that we are now second in the science chart. So that is absolutely fantastic. Great feedback to um, what we've already kind of had coming in from people who have been listening to it. I'm Finn van der Aar. It's been brilliant to have you all here and we are looking forward to chatting to you over in the podcast.